Hello, and welcome to today's webcast being brought to you by the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research and the Knowledge Translation for Employment Research Center at SEDL, which is now an affiliate of the American Institutes for Research. Both centers are funded by the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research in the U.S. Department of Education. This is John Westbrook, director of the centers and also co-chair of the Knowledge Translation and Implementation Coordinating Group of the Campbell Collaboration, often referred to as C2. We're delighted to bring today's webcast to you, featuring the work and resources of the Education Coordinating Group of C2 and to discuss a recently published systematic review that was developed through the Education Coordinating Group. I know you will find it very useful, and I thank our speakers today, who are Dr. Carlton Fong, Managing Editor of the Education Coordinating Group, and Dr. Kathleen Murphy, a Program Director at SEDL. Thank you both for being here and for the effort you've put into planning for this webcast. I'm going to be asking some questions that will help guide our discussion. And the first one is going to be directed at Carlton. Can you tell us more about what the C2 Education Coordinating Group is and what it does? Sure. The Campbell Collaboration Education Coordinating Group is an international network of scholars, policymakers, practitioners, funders, students, and others who are interested in evidence-based practice and systematic reviews within the field of education. The Campbell Collaboration Education Coordinating Group, or ECG, exists to help people make well-informed decisions about educational interventions. Our mission is to provide rigorous and relevant systematic reviews of educational research and share this information broadly. By identifying what works, what doesn't, and why, we aim to improve educational outcomes for all learners. The ECG considers systematic reviews that address the effects of social and policy interventions across the full spectrum of learners. The scope of this group is wide and its areas of interest range from clearly uh, demarcated problems that affect educational uh, development to broad areas of concern to education policy in the following areas. Compulsory school age education, special education, adult education, early childhood, higher education, and disability. Systematic reviews that fall within the scope of the ECG may include interventions uh, delivered in any setting with potential impacts on educational outcomes, as well as interventions uh, delivered in school settings focused on any or all of the following outcomes, academic outcomes, social and behavioral competencies, uh, community integration, health, and well-being. That is the ECG's group scope including both school-based programming and community or home-based interventions that are relevant to educational development for all learners. I see. So who's involved in the ECG? Well, the ECG consists of multiple members. First, there are two co-chairs, which are currently filled by Dr. Paul Connolly and Dr. Gary Ritter. They are responsible for the internal governance of the ECG. They also maintain working relationships with other Campbell entities and groups outside of C2, and formally accept and reject systematic reviews in consultation with the editor, among many other responsibilities. The editor, Dr. Sandra Jo Wilson, is responsible for the editorial activities of ECG, providing substantive and methodological feedback to authors, guiding the entire a review process for teams to effectively conduct systematic reviews. The managing editor role, which is my current position, involves the procedural aspects of the editorial process, such as uh, reviewing title submissions, recruiting peer reviewers, and providing other assistance to the ECG. In addition, we currently have one subgroup coordinator role in our 
disability subgroup, which of course is filled by you, John, as you serve in a similar fashion as the co-chairs would regarding the specific workings of the subgroup. Lastly, we collaborate closely with an information retrieval specialist, Mr. David Pickup. He helps us evaluate the rigor of the protocols and completed uh, reviews, uh, considering in particular how systematic the author teams were in their retrieval of all possible relevant studies. We also collaborate with uh, the methods group. Its members provide assistance in evaluating the, method the methodological soundness of our reviews. Okay, now a question of particular interest to me. What are the goals of the ECG's disability subgroup, and why was your systematic review identified with this subgroup? The disability subgroup has four key objectives. First, to undertake and maintain a series of high-quality and timely systematic reviews of interventions aimed at improving the quality of life and outcomes of individuals with disabilities. Second, to establish and maintain a network of individuals with disability expertise or experience who are interested in developing and or contributing to disability-related systematic reviews. Third, to encourage involvement of consumers with disabilities, their family members, and other disability-oriented stakeholders in all steps of the systematic uh, review process, including the development and dissemination of appropriate user-friendly interpretations of results. And lastly, to provide training opportunities for inter interested systematic uh, review authors in the production of Campbell reviews in the disability area. Our review that we just completed falls within the scope of ECG's disability subgroup because our recent systematic, re systematic review concerned the employment of cancer survivors. Under the ADA, cancer constitutes a disability, and this fact is not widely known. Examining interventions that can help those after cancer treatment to return to work or keep working is therefore an issue pertinent to the disability subgroup of Campbell and ECG. Thanks, Carlton. Okay, so Kathleen, let's hear more about the systematic review. What was the topic that the review addressed, and uh, what, what did it address uh, any specific need? Sure. Um, well, as one might infer from its title, the review addressed behavioral, psychological, educational, and vocational interventions that facilitated employment outcomes for cancer survivors. Got that? That's kind of a mouthful, so let me explain a little more first. We should mention that for the purpose of this review, we focused on studies that included adults aged 18 years or older who had a past or present cancer diagnosis that occurred while the individual was 18 years or older. So we excluded, in effect, studies of adults who were survivors of pediatric cancer. We were thinking these individuals may have participated in interventions as children, like maybe a high school transition to work program. So participating in a program like that, um, one would hope, would affect employment outcomes. But people who developed cancer as adults would not have been involved in anything like that. Second, the review was designed to be of use especially to audiences of CEDL's Center on Knowledge Translation for Employment Research, which we call the Cater Center. And these audiences included members of the business community, vocational rehabilitation professionals, policymakers, and people with disabilities. And as Colton was just mentioning, what a lot of people don't realize is that that last population, the people with disabilities, includes, at least from a legal perspective, cancer survivors. So let me give a little more background on that. Um, provisions of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, really are very relevant to a discussion of cancer survivors and discrimination in the workplace, particularly since it was amended in 2008 in, in the way that it was amended. The 2008 amendments, which took effect in 2009, so just about six years ago, clarified what kinds of conditions constitute a disability. The legislation defines disability as having, quote, a physical or mental impairment 
that substantially limits one or more major life activities, end quote, or, quote, a record of such impairment. So that's two ways you could be protected. And then a third way is, quote, being regarded as having such an impairment. Um, any discriminatory action that targets someone who does not have a disability, but who associates with someone who does, and you could think here that might be a parent or a spouse of someone with a disability, is that discriminating against someone in that situation is also prohibited under the ADA. Okay, so then in the amendments, the phrase major life activity was defined more completely. The word working is explicitly mentioned as well as, quote, operation of a major bodily function, end quote, and in a bunch of long list of functions, cell growth was included. So this latter reference to cell growth has clear and obvious uh, implications for cancer. Now these amendments, they're you know, relatively new, and many of those who benefit from them are definitely not yet aware that employees with cancer qualify for ADA protection. Now think about it, this lack of awareness is happening at the same time that the number of cancer survivors in the workforce has grown. It's great, treatments are more successful, so there are growing numbers of cancer survivors, and the rates of cancer patients eventually returning to work range from 56% to 89%. I mean, whether or not someone returns to work can depend upon a whole number of things, such as age and type of cancer, but um, in any case, it's still a majority. <coughs> the, the lowest rate of return to work in the studies that have been published is 56%. So especially since the recession, people are retiring later or continuing to work part-time, more older workers translates to more workers who have cancer. That's why it's especially important now to, dis to study survivors' employment-related issues so we can know how best to design interventions to address those issues. So in sum, we did this review from a disability and employment research perspective, not a medical perspective. Basically, we wanted to find out by doing this review if there were any evidence-based interventions that might be relevant to employers or service providers that did not involve pharmaceutical or medical treatment. Our thinking was that knowing more about non-medical approaches might allow for more feasible implementation within workplace settings. Okay, I see. Um, what were the key findings of your review, Carlton? So after conducting an exhaustive search of relevant studies that measured the effect of an intervention on the employment outcomes of cancer survivors, as Kathleen just uh, described, we found 12 studies that met our inclusion criteria. Ten of those studies measured employment status after an intervention, whether um, a cancer survivor was employed or unemployed after this intervention. So we calculated, um, we um, found two main measures which were used for employment status, which was whether they were employed or not, or return to work, whether they return to work um, with, with their previous job. So since studies that measured employment status did not distinguish whether participants had prior employment before cancer diagnosis or treatment, we combined these two measurements as a single measure of gainful employment status. The results of the studies were synthesized in a random effects meta-analysis using the odds ratio effect sizes. The, the weighted mean effect size for employment status was an odds ratio of 1.71, favoring the intervention groups. So to better interpret the odds ratio, we went ahead and converted the mean's odd, odds ratio to percentages. So first, calculating a baseline employment rate for all the comparison groups across studies, which was around 60%. If we have an odds ratio of 1.71, this translates to an employment rate of about 71% for intervention and uh, participants, which we think is a non-trivial change. We did not find, however, that the interventions affected the number of hours worked or the number of sick leave days taken. All right, given that, what would you say are the implications of this systematic review for the areas of policy and practice, Kathleen? Well, I mean, think about it, John. Given that there are a number of survivors in the workplace is growing, 
Um, so there's going to be a variety of policy and practices that are germane. Some that come to mind might be, what should an individual manager do when an employee discloses cancer? Or thinking more at an institutional policy level, um, cancer patients benefit from the provision of more than medical services, right? Their condition creates other, often interrelated, vocational, rehabilitational, psychosocial, legal, and work-related needs. So what are ways that medical staff might work in interdisciplinary teams who together might coordinate these often interrelated needs? And then if we're going to have employers involved in those teams, what can companies do to equip their staff, especially supervisors, to help them know how best to manage cancer in the workplace? If employees want their involvement, meaning if employees want to be involved in such teams, because obviously you need to disclose your cancer first before you would be engaged in anything like this. Um, how might employers participate in the interdisciplinary teams working with the other kinds of service providers or at least be staying in communication with them? So these are the kinds of implications. And based on the results of this review, really, no one should develop a policy or intervention and then claim what they're doing is, strictly speaking, evidence-based. Now, in a few minutes, Carlton will explain more about the limitations with respect to the scientific rigor of the studies we found. But nonetheless, I mean, our hope obviously is that existing research can help to inform these kinds of questions that are coming up, even if given the nature of the research base backing up what seem to be recommended courses of action, the answers are provisional. Very interesting. So what types of interventions did you find that have been used to tackle this problem, Kathleen? Well, sure. I mean, absolutely. A first step, you know, if you want to inform decision making and these kinds of questions, is to look at the interventions we found among the small group of studies that met our criteria for rigor that also had positive effects on employment outcomes. Now, consistent with an earlier Cochrane systematic review that a team led by DeBoer conducted on this topic, we also found that multi-component interventions were the most effective approach to facilitate employment. Well, they did, they did often take place in a medical setting, but these interventions incorporated, say, information or educational training, counseling, whether it was individual or group counseling, coping skills sessions, and also physical exercise components seem to be promising features for practitioners to integrate into current rehabilitation and adjustment efforts for cancer patients. Now, when you think through what about vocational interventions specifically, um, other research published by Tominga in 2013 suggests that on-the-job supports, interview training, and strategies to cope with symptoms while working can directly impact return to work and sustaining employment. Now, if these results, thinking back to whether or not employers are going to be involved, the results of our systematic review are, of course, referring to cancer survivors themselves as the research participants. What the review does not address is what businesses might need to do in order to be involved most effectively in supporting their employees with cancer. I mean, it seems like learning about the ADA and other resources would be a logical implication, even though, again, we can't say it's an evidence-based conclusion. OK. Well, given that, how certain can you be that you learned about something that works based on your review of the available research? What would your response to that question be, Carlton? Well, overall, our systematic review found limited evidence of sufficient methodological rigor to confidently assess the effects of interventions for employment of cancer survivors. For one reason, the number of randomized controlled trials, or RCTs, was few in number. And even with quasi-experimental studies, and we'll explain what those are, the sample sizes were actually pretty small, ranging from treatment groups of 7 to 172. Moreover, the majority of studies lacked information about the study elements which are needed to assess things like risk of bias or simply evidence high risk of bias. One particular study characteristic, for example, that was consistently missing from reports was an assessment of treatment of, of fidelity, a useful aspect for interpreting particularly conspicuous findings and to aid in, broad, 
and broadening how well we can generalize our findings, right? How well was the intervention implemented as it was intended? Many of these reports didn't really say that. So although some studies report a dosage of the intervention and a contamination of the control group, such as the study conducted by Taminga and colleagues that Kathleen just mentioned, they, they have a discussion of whether the intervention was implemented as intended was lacking. Overall, the internal and external validity of the included studies were limited. Secondly, the number of included studies was small given our inclusion criteria, producing a much larger pool of studies that were excluded. Also, the wide range of the types of interventions that were included, such as these multi-component interventions or counseling interventions, most likely decreases our precision of our results in this review. And lastly, the included studies demonstrated a narrow age range, in particular, mainly older age participants. The nature of our population, cancer survivors, tends to be older since cancer diagnoses are more common as people age. Nine of the 10 studies that reported participant age had individuals of an average age of over 50 years. It's true that in the U.S., people are staying longer in the workforce, at least part-time, particularly since the recession. That said, the field would benefit from additional research on these particular interventions with younger, particip with younger participants. With findings from studies of more targeted interventions with younger workers, recommendations for the effectiveness of these programs could be put forth that were, po that were both more specific about what to do and more informative about what practices are or aren't effective in various settings and populations. Interesting. Let me ask you a methodological question about the types of research designs you included in this review. For example, you mentioned randomized control trials, or RCTs, and quasi-experimental designs, or non-RCTs. Can you explain some of the differences between these two types of designs as shown in your systematic review? Sure. Basically, RCTs, or randomized control trials, use random assignment to a treatment or control group, whereas quasi-experimental designs, or QEDs, are missing one of these components, either the random assignment or the control group. Hence, they are not true experimental studies, such as an RCT. That's why they have uh, the prefix quasi. They are quasi-experimental. So because we found uh, studies with both of these types of designs, we performed an exploratory analysis to, di to distinguish effects of the RCTs from the QEDs. For the RCTs, the mean effect size for employment status had an odd ratio of 1.44. Once again, translating these to percentages, we see that the employment rate of about 68% for intervention participants compared to the baseline 60% for comparison groups. However, for the QEDs, the weighted mean effect size was an odds ratio of 2.18. The mean odds ratio of 2.18 for the QEDs translates to an employment rate of about 77% for intervention participants compared to the baseline rate of 60%. So therefore, we see uh, that the QEDs had a larger effect size than the RCTs, although we saw that there were not statistically significant difference between the two types of experiment experimental designs. Pretty much, this result provides a potentially troubling indication. The QED studies may be overestimating intervention effects on employment, whereas the RCT studies, when examined alone, result in a non-significant mean effect size. Therefore, caution needs to be exercised when interpreting the effectiveness of these interventions for increasing employment and the need for RCTs. The need for more randomized controlled trials in this area is needed. Okay, thanks for that. Um, your systematic review has been completed and has just been published in the C2 library. Congratulations on that, by the way. But there appears to be a lot more research being produced in this area. Can you talk us through what happens to systematic reviews in the Campbell Library, like yours, 
after it's been published, especially any kind of updating processes? Yes, the Campbell Collaboration encourages author teams to update their systematic reviews every three years. As the landscape of research, as you mentioned, is continually changing and evolving, the nature of the evidence is also changing. Therefore, updating reviews is an important aspect to the systematic nature of reviewing to ensure that the evidence is up to date and accurate for impactful policy making and program development for the future. Okay, that's good to know. Kathleen, could you also talk a little bit more about the direction your research is taking? Absolutely. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning of this webcast, this systematic reviews production was supported by CEDL's Center on Knowledge Translation for Employment Research, funded by the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Now the CATERS research follows a set trajectory. Step one was to conduct a systematic review on a topic of relevance to disability employment. So we've done that. Step two was to collect data from our target audiences about what kinds of factors acted as barriers and facilitators to the uptake of evidence into practice, and this step has also been completed. It involved, among other activities, conducting focus groups with members of the business community. Participants in those focus groups told us that if they were going to use any research findings, those findings would have to be relevant to an existing business need or maybe a legal mandate. People in business also use online resources quite a bit. And while, frankly, maybe it's not always easy for researchers to acknowledge this fact, but shocker, not everyone wants to hear about research from researchers. So taking those three findings together, the Cater Center recruited a trainer from the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC, Mr. Joe Bontke, to deliver information about cancer and employment. Now that contact did, content did include findings from the systematic review, but we put it in a broader context, um, talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act and other information about laws and resources for employees with cancer. The delivery mechanism was online. It's a webcast we have recorded, and for those who are interested, you can go to um, www.cater.org, and there's information about the webcast and how to register on the website. So to make a long story short, the third phase of Cater's research is testing the impact of this training, a very common knowledge translation strategy, and we're doing it today, doing a webcast. And the audience that we're testing it among is individuals who are supervisors or work in human resources. And again, we're still enrolling participants, so if you don't want to go to the Cater website and you want to go directly to register, you can also go to um, www.tinyurl.com slash cancer training. And um, this, to be eligible, you would have to be a supervisor or work in human resources in, in the US. So um, it's an hour-long webcast. And if it's of interest, those who participate get one hour of um, HRCI credit. Now, as far as thinking about other future directions, CETL is involved in other work related to cancer and employment, but it's really beyond the scope of this webcast. It involves partners at the Southwest ADA Center, as well as some other entities. Cater also has other research activities related to testing knowledge translation strategies about um, other topics and other audiences. So if you have questions about this greater portfolio of research, go ahead and get in touch with me. Um, you can contact me at Kathleen, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N dot Murphy, which is M-U-R-P-H-Y, at F, as in Southwest, E-D-L dot org. Or um, you, obviously, Cater and KTDR's PI, our very own John Westbrook, who I'm talking with right here today. You can contact him at John, J-O-H-N dot Westbrook, conventional spelling, at S-E-D-L. Org. All right, thank you very much. Our time, believe it or not, is about up. Thanks to both of you, Kathleen and Carlton, for being with us and sharing information about C2 and its education coordinating group, and uh, especially your new systematic review in today's webcast. Uh, we'd love for you, the listeners, to get in touch with us if you have questions or would like to get involved by working in a group or authoring a systematic review, perhaps. You'll see there is a link on the current slide 
for contacting us and feel free to give us some feedback about how helpful you felt this webcast was. If you'd like to get in touch about the uh, Campbell collaboration in general, uh, that contact email address is uh, on the slide. Uh, and so we would invite you to uh, contact uh, them and the C2 website. Or you can follow on Twitter and Facebook for updates on what's going on in the collaboration if you are so inclined. Uh, we thank you for joining us for this webcast today, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Goodbye.